Hi, everybody. So welcome to day nine of the 14-Day Freestyle Libra Challenge. And so I'm really excited to have here with us tonight, we've got Layla Bateman and Keelan Hankin from Island Nutrition Bermuda. So both of these ladies are dietitians. They've been working for a number of years. They'll tell you a little bit more about their sel themselves. They'll tell you about their experience uh, that they've had with the Libra and also some of their top tips because, um, well, they're pretty busy because I send a lot of people their way here in Bermuda to get some dietary counseling. So let me just stop this here, the screen, and let's turn it over to you ladies. All right, good evening, everyone. So I guess, um, should we do a quick introduction? Wonderful, yes. So I'm Layla Bateman, I'm working at Island Nutrition, and I've been here in Bermuda for about two years now. Um, previously, I was specializing in renal, so people on dialysis and also touched on a bit of diabetes as well but since being here I think because of the demographic I've done a lot more diabetes um, and it's an area that I like specializing in actually I find it really interesting and there's a lot of input that we can have and a lot of changes we can make so I think moving forward definitely more in that area and a bit of weight management as well. So I'm Kaylin, I'm obviously Layla's colleague, and I've I've been in Bermuda for about just over three years now, um, but working for the same company at Island Nutrition. So this was my first community-based job. Um, I came from a similar background to Layla, so I worked in the hospital previously within the NHS in the UK, um, but I mostly worked in surgery, oncology mostly, um, which was very different to what I do now. But since moving to Bermuda, my caseload has definitely changed. I did do a bit of diabetes outpatient clinic in the UK, but a lot more over my past three years of being in Bermuda, which again, same thing as Leila. I, it's one of the things I find really interesting in clinic because you have a lot of information to go off of if you are wearing the Freestyle Libra. Normally, we'd also have food diaries to look at too. So I'm sure you guys are on day nine of wearing the Libra. So You've learned how to, or figuring out how to kind of cross-reference your blood sugar readings as well as what you're eating and how that looks before and after you check your blood sugars. But it's definitely a lot. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite special kind of specialist areas to work on at the minute. But very similar to Leila, I do mostly diabetes, weight management, and kidney disease, um, with a little bit of heart disease on the side and some more niche areas, but mostly diabetes at the minute. So it's wonderful. And as you see, you know, it kind of blew me away too when I moved to Bermuda, you know, over 10 years ago initially. And the amount of diabetes on this little island is quite overwhelming. And, you know, the renal disease that goes along with it, like, um, you know, the number of amputees that we have on the island is so huge. Mm -hmm. And so we know that prevention is such an important part of things. And so I kind of applaud those that are here tonight that don't even have prediabetes, but they just want to know, right? Because mm -hmm. They just know that having a healthier lifestyle. And also, you know, one of the things that I've picked up is that we're seeing a lot of, you know, insulin resistance. We're seeing a lot of those changes even before that A1C hits that number, right? Um, so it's it's really amazing to have this device. So yeah. so how have you guys been doing with it with yourselves? Did you did you monitor yourself? Did you give it your an experiment? Yes, so, absolutely. <laughs> we both put them on exactly the same time. Um, but I actually, I think it was the day after or two days after I put mine on, I flew to New York. So I had like a holiday view of my my blood sugars, which was interesting. And also the day that I placed mine, one of my patients actually brought me in some homemade hot cross buns with lots of icing on. So it was, that was, that was a good excuse to have a couple of hot cross buns, see what happens with my blood sugars. But um, it was very interesting wearing it because obviously uh, during in clinic, we I would use the Libra a lot to check people's blood sugars and to figure out where they are within their target range. And we kind of play around with it. But wearing it myself and being able to kind of understand, I guess, what it's like to wear every single day and how, you know, from the other side of things, it definitely gave me a lot better insight into how often you need to remember to to check it for one and the right times so I know obviously it's ideal to kind of check your blood sugars a few hours or a couple of hours after you've eaten to get a, 
a good picture, but it's really hard to remember sometimes. That was the one thing that I really struggled with is trying to remember. But um, it was interesting going away on holidays. I'm not too sure. I think I spoke to, I know Sarah Bosch-Denoya may have had a conversation before. I'm not too sure if she kind of touched on it when she talked previously, but she did mention that when you go through airport security, you kind of meant to be careful in case it wipes your reading. So I was a little bit cautious of that, but I don't know if anybody's experienced that happening or anybody's mentioned it. I've just had some people, my patients say that it can be a hassle because they have to kind of be patted down some people when they see the sensor. Um, mm -hmm. But I haven't heard that it actually wiped the data, but maybe yeah. it's just a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, I found it a very interesting, um, interesting insight, actually. I think I assumed that how I ate may have been better. <laughs> there were definitely some higher numbers on there that I wasn't expecting. A few things that sort of caught me off guard, but unlike Keelan, I think I was the complete opposite. I was the person <laughs> who was constantly scanning it. I was like, I wonder what it is now. I wonder what it is now. So <laughs> I probably didn't get a clear picture initially of that one to two hours post eating because I was just scanning it straight away to see what was happening and um, so that probably gave me some higher readings for sure I also feel like I understood the I guess some people feel uncomfortable wearing it especially now it's coming to like summer months and it's visible and I did really understand that going into the gym I had about four or five people coming up to me and asking me you know why am I wearing this am I diabetic and I was like okay this is a lot of questions guys but um I'm, I'm wearing it for research so I do understand that why people feel a little bit like they don't want to wear it and I found that I put mine quite far back on my arm behind um so it really wasn't visible very often it, you know, gym clothes, yes, it was, but I found that was quite a good spot because some people, you know, I'd have to show them and then they'd see that it was there. Um, things that really surprised me though, oat milk latte after a workout definitely spiked a lot more than I thought. So, you know, that was probably from a fasting point, having just done a workout, I'd probably eaten about three hours prior to that. Um but it didn't have any sweetener in, and that was quite a big spike from the oat milk. And it's something I was already aware of, but I didn't think it would be quite that much. Can you remember how many points it went up? It was over 140. And can you remember what it was bef like beforehand? Before, no. Because no. I really just had it after the gym and then had that. And I was like, okay, that's a substantial increase. Um but I'm assuming before it would have been under 100 at that point. So that was a bit of a shock. And jam on toast. So I'd eaten my eggs <laughs> first. I'd prepped my stomach with the protein like I tell everyone to do. And I was like, right, well, I've had my protein and have this jam on toast. And that really, like, really shot up after that. And I was like, OK, so doesn't affect me well when it's sugary jam in there. <laughs> yeah, it's like probably like your hot cross buns actually yeah yeah I think as well um Dr Keenan you mentioned you were talking about alcohol at the very beginning and that was one of the things I definitely noticed spike a lot quicker well I knew it would spike but it spiked definitely much quicker than I expected especially because of the fact that depending on the meal I had obviously I wasn't really focusing on protein content and things when I was in New York maybe I should have been um so if I was having uh, obviously a high carbohydrate meal with an alcoholic drink, they were the numbers were spiking. They were going up by about 60 points very quickly, actually, and then dropping back down again. But it was good to see how, how much everything jumps up by and how quickly as well. So you have that information ready to hand straight away rather than, you know, trying to cross reference everything in clinic when somebody brings it in. So... Yeah, the alcohol thing was a good one because that's probably one of the few things that people do not document on their food diary unless I really, really push them to. But a lot of people forget to document it. So it was good to be able to see that. It's I don't know if anybody else has been checking that when they're, when they're wearing theirs. I think people are trying to keep a watch on the, the alcohol. Uh, there was a comment, uh, Layla, about when you did your exercise, 
because, you know, sometimes we can see with very intense, like CrossFit, or if it's a really intense workout, you can see the sugar go up. But was that the only day you saw it? Like, did you do other workouts and it didn't go up? Yeah, I did some other workouts and it didn't go up like that. That was um, <laughs> it was the oat milk latte. That was my post workout oat milk latte as my treat. Um, yeah, but it, saying that, I've seen increases, like you said, when I guess the body is under more stress from quite um, you know a heavy workout. But I also noticed a day when I hadn't slept very well that my usual fasting in the morning was very low it actually kept telling me that it was you know under 70 I'm having a hypo I was like no I'm fine but um that day when I hadn't slept very well my food choices I know weren't as good but I could tell that it was generally higher throughout the day yeah it's just all those little things that we begin to notice right and that's why for me you know when I'm working with patients especially when we start to see that fasting up and the sleep is poor because so many people think I'm eating well in the daytime and they are, but if they're chronically not sleeping, then that's gonna chronically give them that number, right? And this is gonna add to that insulin resistance. And so rather than trying to reduce their carbs more than before, they just need to get to sleep at night. Yeah, absolutely. It makes, it makes a massive difference, even if it's you know physiologically or then it's going to affect your food choices the next day. You're tired and you just want to grab some carbohydrates or something sweet to give you a burst of energy or even some caffeine. But then that just perpetuates the cycle for the rest of the day. Yeah, and you maybe don't feel energetic enough to do a workout or go for a walk and you just want to sleep a little bit more. Yeah, it has exactly. a massive one effect. Yeah. Yeah, so when you're working with your patients, like as you've, you've both been having a lot more experience now, like in community-based diabetic care. And I think you've had some experience working with groups and, and at uh, different areas here in Bermuda. So what are some of the key things that people come in, you know, that they're talking about, that you feel that you can help, like those little nudges? Because sometimes people, you know, I know they come in and they're overwhelmed and, you know, they come and see me and I kind of over scare them to death, you know, and then I'm like, <laughs> okay, go see the nutritionist. We're just going to start with baby steps. So what's your approach? Do you want to go first, Leila? I think one of my favorite, my favorite things to start with, because I feel like it's often overlooked, is the quality of your breakfast, the way you start your day, and whether or not you're going to set yourself up for having a lot of spikes and dips in your glucose levels, or you're going to set yourself up with a really stable blood sugar first thing in the morning. and I think very often popular breakfasts are things like cereals or, you know, very sweet cereals or toast, very carbohydrate heavy, which is fine, but they don't often include anything else as part of that. So usually I start from basics in terms of regular meal patterns and what do those meals consist of. And breakfast is usually the one that might be just, you know, a bowl of sweet cereal which is going to give a massive spike in the glucose and then a massive dip and then low energy and then craving something else so starting that with something that has protein in it a good source of protein a whole piece of fruit or vegetables if you can but you know that's dependent on what you're having and some healthy fats and some fiber in there and I think that's one of the most overlooked things because people often skip it or have, you know, something very simple in the mornings. Mm. Yeah, I think I would also agree. It's probably, the, that's definitely the first place I would start is always making sure that there's a decent source of protein at breakfast. Because like you said, we're kind of told like, the best meal of the day is breakfast time. But a lot of people, I would say in Bermuda, depending on um, where people work, we grab and go quite a bit at breakfast time if we do get breakfast or we eat at our desk or we eat at work or whatever, whatever we tend to do. So it's trying to find something that's quick, easy, convenient. That also means then that you can kind of eat it at your desk at work. But the, the crucial thing is a source of protein. So like Leila's example is perfect there. If you have time in the morning to kind of make sure that you have a cooked protein or a source of protein with a slice of toast and maybe some healthy fats. So whether that's a slice of toast with avocado and scrambled egg or whatever if you have time if it's something that you need to really grab and go of um 
one of the main things I do get people to do is like yogurts are pretty quick and easy, although they can be tricky in supermarkets to find ones that are not extremely high in sugar. And the crucial thing is trying to make sure that you're not teaming it with something else like granola. So if you're choosing, let's say, a yogurt, whether you choose a high protein option that are in the supermarkets, I think Skier or I think Chobani has a high protein one. The ideal option, and it's not for everybody, is an unflavored, like low fat Greek yogurt that you then add flavor to rather than relying on the manufacturer to add extra sugar to sweeten it up. So let's say you have a low fat plain yogurt with maybe some fruit and you could even add extra kind of nuts in there for crunch. So it's something quick and easy that you can maybe pack and eat at your desk if you don't have time to cook something in the morning. And it will make a massive difference again to your blood sugars later on in the day. And it's just crucial in trying to keep you fuller for longer. So you're not having to snack later on or having an extremely high carbohydrate kind of meal in the middle of the day at lunchtime because you're trying to catch up. So then you're having, you know, this kind of fluctuation of your carbohydrate intake as well throughout the day and your blood sugars. Um, the other thing, which is one of the main things that I would also say at the very beginning, first consult is try to really avoid any drinks with any added sugar unless you absolutely really can't miss it then team it up with your meal that has a source of protein in so fruit juices in general if you're if you are diabetic that would be the first thing I would kind of touch on if you're pre-diabetic or you're just being cautious and you don't have any problems with your blood sugars currently obviously a glass of fruit juice is fine alongside a breakfast but it's more things like the sodas or uh, like ginger ale or ginger beer or any kind of lemonades or things like that trying to choose sugar-free options if you have to have them or even the sparkling water options that are sugar-free like LaCroix or Perrier are, are a much better option to try and avoid that immediate spike that will happen if you have a sugary beverage. Yeah. yeah. Very popular here as well, sugary drinks or fruit yeah. juices as well. And I don't know if, if anybody's kind of tested it out and seen even if you just drink kind of like a soda by itself. And it's I don't know if anybody's kind of noticed during your nine days, whether that's caused a very big spike, bigger than they would expect. But it's definitely one of the biggest culprits to sending someone on their way to having a high kind of day throughout. And then you're kind of trying to catch up with yourself throughout the day. So it's definitely the one of the things I would limit the most, if, if not trying to avoid if you are diabetic. So basically no liquid calories, kind of trying to avoid things or no liquid carbohydrates. Yeah. yeah, if possible. So obviously if you have like a coffee with milk or tea with milk, that's fine. But it's just being careful with what you add to things like that. And one of the, the the topics I have to cover quite a lot in clinic as well is, unfortunately, obviously there are, there are a lot of different sugary things we can add to drinks and some are seen, or help than health, some are seen healthier than others. So honey and agave are kind of like the, the most popular ones. Um, I've just seen that uh, question there. Um, honey and agave are the most popular ones that people are trying to avoid sugar. But it works the same way, unfortunately. Um, sugar also is a natural product, even though we see it slightly differently. But they all react very, very similar. So if you are adding honey or agave to your tea or coffee and you're unsure why all of a sudden your blood sugars are spiking, it's just time to try and either reduce it, wean off it, or swap it for, if you absolutely have to, an artificial sweetener. But I know people aren't massive fans, but it's a good middle ground just to kind of adjust your taste to less sweet drinks, I guess. What about kombucha? Someone asked a question. Um, yeah. What's your um, experience? The best, the, the best thing to, oh, sorry, Leila, do you want to answer this one? That's fine, go ahead. Are you sure? <laughs> um, so it depends on where you're going, but the, the only way really to do it is to try and check the nutrition label. Some of the kombuchas in Bermuda obviously have a lot of added sugar in them and some have very little. Um, I'm trying to remember the brand that I've bought before and it doesn't seem to be extremely high. It's in Supermart and there's a it's tumor. A right one. I don't know, but I know it's as soon as, it's, I don't know if anybody shops, it shops at Supermart. As soon as you walk in the spinach section, there's mm, bottles of kombucha seen, on the I've side. I've seen one local one, which was actually quite good. And then another one that had a, a lot, a lot of sugar in it. Yeah. Ideally, if you're looking at a nutrition label, if you could potentially get less than five grams per serving that would be great um but I don't know if you change that advice for a drink normally Leila um but I think that kombucha only had two when I looked at it the one that I was looking at 
I'll try and figure out the brand and, and let you guys know. Yeah, like this is one of the popular brands, this GTs, you know. Yes. And it and comes many- a lot. So this one is a carrot turmeric. And I think I bought it because it's a little bit lower, but it's the whole bottle. Now the whole bottle is 500 mils. Mm. The whole bottle is 12 grams. Mm. Oh, okay, great. I know that there's another bottle. I think it's called Synergy. It's a mix or Trilogy, something like that. Mm. And I know it's kind of on the lower end, but, um, you know, typically what I've said to people too, is you don't need a whole bottle of kombucha. You know, if you're drinking it for, as a probiotic, Mm -hmm. you know, even just taking a half a bottle or, you know, for me, I have kombucha because I like to have it as a drink when I come home instead of having like an alcoholic beverage. Yeah. Um, But you know what I'm going to do? I haven't tested this one. I'm going to take, I'll take one cup of it and I'll see what happens on its own. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll try that. (laughs) Yeah, I think the only the only real way to do it is just check the label. And I think if you're like Dr. Keenan just said, just kind of um, figuring out the portion size, first of all. So if you're going to drink a whole bottle, you know, you're getting 12 grams of added sugar there. If you're only going to drink half, six grams is not that bad for uh, a drink. And if you want to be extra cautious, just maybe drink it alongside a meal that includes protein. I don't know. Have you have any other advice, Leila, when it comes to drinks and I would literally say, like you said, just look at the labels. They're so different in their composition. And I think once you find your like go-to brand, then that's great. You know, you know what's in it and that'll be the one you go for. Okay. Is um, someone's written there. Is GTS another brand? I think it must be. That's this one. GTS. Ah, Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yes. Yeah. Um, (laughs) As you were saying that about sweet things in the morning, something that often comes up in clinic is people's smoothies in the morning. That is <laughs> often something that we end up discussing and changing to some extent because, you know, they can contain so much fruit in them, which has been broken down, blended, and absolutely has the potential to cause a massive spike in your glucose levels. So I think that's something that comes up a lot. Um, I don't tell people to take them out completely, but I do recommend that they are mindful of the portion of fruit that's in there. So no more than a portion of fruit. And then also to think about the composition of it as a whole. So rather than it just being fruit and maybe fruit juice in there to have a portion of fruit Think about containing and adding some healthy fats, whether that is going to be some kind of nut butter or avocado. Even some people put like olive and sorry, coconut oil in there. And then also adding protein if you can through things like a plain Greek yogurt and even adding things like chia seeds or any other seeds in there as well to make it more as if that were a balanced meal, you know, that has all the components of a meal in it. And I think that's had some really good results, actually, just being mindful of that and not having potentially five or six portions of fruit all in one go, all in the morning. Yeah. And it definitely, it helps to keep people fuller for longer because if you're having, let's say your smoothie is normally two or three cup measures of frozen fruit and you're adding maybe apple or orange juice to that. So you have a very high carbohydrate um, meal or drink, but then like we're we're already talking about it'll spike your blood sugars and then it won't really last for very long but if you're doing exactly what it sounds like you guys have already spoken about including protein if you're always thinking about how can I make a balanced meal it's always okay have I got a source of protein great have I got a source of some healthy fats or fats in general like Leila just mentioned whether that's nuts or nut butter olive oil coconut oil or avocado and then just focusing on the carbohydrate portion size so obviously in this case it's a smoothie but really you wouldn't normally sit and eat seven or six portions of fruit in one sitting so we we don't want to blend that down into a drink either so it's just trying to create that balance and you know just keeping an eye on what your blood sugars do I guess and if you know that you react quite quickly to it then it's just about introducing less fruit and more protein and a little bit more fats just to also keep you fuller for longer too it was one of the first big takeaways I had with a patient And, you know, she thought, she really thought this was so healthy Mm -hmm. and she was pre-diabetic, but it took her to 180, you know, like it was super, super high on more than Mm -hmm. one occasion. So, um, but it's, you're right, just pair it up and that will help to keep, keep people sustained for a little bit longer. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. 
So we've got breakfast and you're right, it's such a, that number one <laughs> beginning of the day as people kind of to get themselves set and established. So that then they don't get the cravings and they can make better choices throughout the day. And then what would you say your next kind of biggest meal or target area would be after breakfast? I don't know if this is in order, but um, just thinking, going back to the protein, looking at both your lunch, evening meal, or even snacks. I think it's something that generally most people are under eating. Most people aren't meeting their protein requirements. Um, you know, let alone if they're active, which a lot of people I see are active and they're going to the gym and everything else. So I think even if you're looking at satiety over your whole day and making sure that you're feeling full and not necessarily wanting to go towards these extra snacks or, you know, carbohydrate heavy snacks for a quick boost of energy, I think that in itself can just be such an easy adjustment to make sure that you're having a good protein portion at each meal and then that you know plays into your snacks as well whether it's protein or it's fats just balancing those but I think that's one thing that I see over and over again people don't realize quite how much protein that their body needs yeah and I think I think also a big thing is the fact that carbohydrates are essentially they are most of the time more appealing so we tend to choose them more. They're also more cost efficient and they last longer. So if you're eating on a budget, normally that can that those portion sizes can creep up because we know they fill us up. Um, but it's just trying to make really a standard serving size of, of any carbohydrate. So when we talk about starchy carbohydrates, we're talking about rice, pasta, potatoes, cereal or bread. So ideally at lunchtime, I would always try to get somebody to include a carbohydrate at lunch. Normally people will say that's one of the hungriest times of day. So if you're kind of running around after the kids or if you're at work or whatever it is you're doing in the middle of the day, that normally you're going to be pretty hungry. So I would normally say about half a cup measure. If you're having more than that, let's say you know that you're already having two cups, but you're trying to reduce your portion size. Reducing it from two to half a cup is quite a big jump. If you feel like there's no way it's going to keep me full, fine. Just reduce slice slightly from what you're used to. So if you're normally doing two cups of rice and we want to reduce it, then you could do half of that. You could do one cup. So it's still slightly over the recommended portion size, but it's still 50% less than you were doing before. But again, if we don't touch that person's plate and all we're doing is reducing the starch portion size, we need to make sure that we're looking at the rest of the plate because there's going to be a gap now. So we want to make sure that the non-starchy veg or the vegetable part of the plate kind of increases. So we want to have at least 50% of the plate would be your vegetables. And if that was maybe a quarter before and your carbohydrate was half, we're just flipping that slightly. So we're doing half of the plate would be your vegetables, a quarter would be your starch and a quarter would be your protein. And that can be something that you bring from home. It doesn't have to be all separate. It could be like a chicken stir fry with some noodles and some veg. Or if you're eating out somewhere, and you're kind of grabbing and going and you're maybe using like a buffet style meal just bear in mind how much of the container you're filling up so a quarter a quarter a half is usually the best way of trying to eyeball something if you're not making it from scratch so a quarter protein a quarter carbohydrate and a half will be your veg it's a pretty balanced meal for for both lunch and dinner but that would be mainly lunch and it's great and some people just need those easy terms to go by because again it can be really overwhelming if they're making huge changes. We know the little changes are the ones that stick. Yeah. Uh, I have a question when we're talking about protein is, do you recommend protein powder? I think if someone's struggling to get protein into their diet and they're using it because, you know, it's easier potentially to have in the morning or, you know, they're not, um, maybe it's cheaper to have a protein powder. I think it's fine to have in there. There's definitely a maximum of protein isolate that one should be consuming. So if they're having, you know, a protein shake in the day, absolutely fine. If they're trying to get all of their protein from protein powder, then that's not the best way to do it. It can be a good shortcut sometimes if somebody's having oats or smoothie, like we talked about before. And if it's a quick way of increasing the protein content and you want to use protein powder because you already have it at home for, or, or if you just want to use it up, um, it's absolutely fine to use. Again, we kind of prioritize um, 
food first. I know protein powder still counts as a food, but we would kind of try and see if we can fit anything else in that's more of a, a whole food product. So whether that be the eggs, the nuts, or or anything that we kind of discussed before, the yogurt. But protein powder is fine. The one thing is, is the same thing. You want to try and check the nutrition label and see how much added sugar is in there. So some of the protein powders can be extra sweet. Some of them can be unsweetened. So if you are keeping an eye on how much kind of added sugar you're taking in, you want to check the nutrition label. So again, kind of aiming for, I don't even know how much it would be per scoop now, but really per serving, you don't want any more than five grams of added sugar. So if you're looking at a protein powder and you're checking and there's zero grams, then great. You can add it to your oats in the morning or your smoothie or or if you do just want it as a shake after the gym, that's fine. But you don't want to rely on it throughout the day, like Leila said. But yeah. Yeah. As much whole food as we can get. Yeah, for sure. And so there's a question too about, is there a benefit to eating different brands of yogurt for to get a, a variety of bacteria strains? Hmm. I, can't, I can't say I really know. I'd say <laughs> I would assume that they may have slightly different, but not sure. How about you, Keelan? That's a tricky one. I just majorly, my, our colleague Hannah is definitely the, the bowel, the bowel expert. So I could ask her and figure it out and see if she has any advice. I'm not sure. I mean, I can imagine that, um, cause most of them have lactobacilli and I'm not too sure what other strains they might have, um, or how I would measure that. So I, I'm actually not sure. Um, but it won't do you any harm. I mean, if you like different brands of different strains or you can find them and you like them, it's certainly going to be a good benefit, but I'm just not too sure of specific, specific options, but I can ask Hannah and see if she has any, any input. And I think some of them, so in Canada, I, I don't know if we have it in Bermuda, like Activia. So Activia is marketed as being good for your gut, you know, and they say it helps you, but also Activia, for example, has a lot of sugar in it because mm -hmm. it's a sweetened yogurt. A lot of sugar. Yeah. If you look at your concentration, going with the kefir actually can often have just as much, well, even more probiotics than some of the yogurts as well. Mm -hmm. And so again, you can get different strains like here in Bermuda, I just picked up one of the Skyr yogurts and they had, you know, they were using strains of bacteria that were Icelandic strains. Okay. You know, just, you know that, that was the mother, the starter that they got. And so when we look at the gut microbiome, having a you know diversity is good so yeah so if you can switch your yogurt up but I would think I would say just the best as you can is trying um, not to have sweetened yogurts really trying to go for the plain yogurts mm -hmm. and then probiotic supplements again you know this is a big question and tomorrow night mm -hmm. we are going to get into a little bit more on microbiome in the gut but again trying to get as much as you can from foods you know for me as a physician if someone's been ill, if they are having active illnesses, if they've had a big infection, often I will get them to supplement with a probiotic, but that's a whole other story because, you know, there's so many different probiotic brands, but right. always real food is good, right? So, you know, if you don't have health issues, eating real food, including your probiotics, but prebiotics, right? And you want to get your probiotics from you know, your yogurt, but we've got things like kombucha, we've got sauerkraut, we've got kimchi, we've got, what's the beet one called? Um, kvass or something like that. Like any of those fer fermented foods are going to give you kind of a wide um, variety of probiotic, uh, of probiotic strains. Yeah, for sure. And I think the, the other bit of advice is it depends on, I mean, sometimes if somebody's having some irritable bowel symptoms and you are including all of those foods and you're still struggling a little bit there is um some advice to say that if you can get a probiotic supplement and you do trial it for maybe three months just note down your symptoms initially if you're having some bowel disturbances try the probiotic that you've chosen for three months take it consistently usually with the largest meal of the day and then see if your symptoms have changed at all over the, the three months um like dr keenan said it's quite a complicated area because there's so many specific probiotics we would need and we're not too sure yet which ones may work for um, each kind of problem but uh, get it from food first if you like to try a probiotic and you notice a marked improvement in three months fantastic if you don't it might be worth trying another one or maybe just focusing on the food and in Canada I don't think we have in Bermuda but there's a probiotic called Align A-L-I-G-N Okay. And so it is, you know, they do have studies that show that over a number of months, 
that people do get better. I can't remember what the specific strains are, um, mm -hmm. but that's one that's sold through pharmacies, but it, it's still over the counter. Yeah, um, I think that's the difficulty, isn't it? It's the quality of them and whether or not that bacteria is actually reaching the gut where it needs to be. Yeah. Because um, we have in the UK is it VSL3, which is again quite a heavily researched um probiotic supplement. Very pricey though. It's really pricey. Um, and then there's Simprove as well. So I think with the other ones, it's quite difficult to know if you're getting the right strain and are they actually, you know, getting to where they need to be in your body? Yeah, that's right. So let food try to do the job most of the time. Yeah. So um, our time is getting on, ladies, but, you know, I know there's so many, maybe some more questions coming through. Um, but talking, so I'm so glad that we touched on protein because I really think that is huge for many, many people, um, that the protein content really of nutrition is not enough. And then what about um, snacking during the days and then evening meals and also eating before bed? Okay. Um, so I guess if we talk, first of all, my question is always when, when people ask me, can I snack? Um, it really depends. It depends if you're hungry. So obviously there's a, we kind of overlook, um, the mindfulness of eating and sometimes we we nearly overcomplicate it especially if there's so many things out there these days like calorie counting apps that really take away how we actually think about how we feel we're just focusing on the numbers all the time so it's really important to kind of really think about actually am I hungry okay I am hungry why is that is it because I skipped my lunch or I didn't have a decent breakfast okay if that's the case I want to have a decent snack now so that I'm making sure that I'm going to be satisfied until my next meal. So same, the same rules follow, I'm going to be bored of me and Leila saying the same thing, but always a decent source of protein, even with a snack. So that could be um, like some kind of trail mix that you maybe make up yourself. So it could be a mixture of some nuts or seeds. We don't, if you do have diabetes or even pre-diabetes, I don't necessarily push a lot of dried fruit but you could have a piece of fresh fruit alongside the nuts rather than raisins or anything like that. Um, so that could be like a nice snack. So fruit and nuts or a low fat plain yogurt with a little bit of added crunch from the nuts or nut butter or piece of fruit. Um, some people like apple slices with nut butter or some popcorns, some, some, depends on the brand. But again, it's the same, same question will always arise how much added sugar is in that particular product. There's a couple of um, lower sugar options out there because I know Bermuda absolutely loves popcorn. So there are definitely some healthier options um, like Skinny Pop and Boom Chicka Pop. And there is another one that I can't remember right now. And just follow the serving size. It's always crucial. They come in the big bags, but follow the serving size. If you just want something in that mid-afternoon lull, try and team it up with a little bit of extra protein if you can. But again, the real question is, how do I feel? Am I hungry because I've missed a meal? Or am I hungry because I'm bored or I'm stressed or I'm upset? There are two different types of hunger. So it's it's a bit tricky to try and navigate through those, but it really is just by asking yourself how you feel. And if you're genuinely hungry, then great, have a snack. Um, dinner time. Or actually, Leila, do you want to touch on the snack bit before... Yeah, I would agree. I, I think it's like having the mindfulness about it because snacking can just become a thing we do out of boredom or habit. And it's not necessarily thought about as in, does this need to be balanced? And whether it's a protein you add in there or a healthy fat um, to make sure that it's not just, you know, some biscuits or just some popcorn or just some chips or crackers. So there's something else alongside it. And also just being mindful of your portion and potentially portioning it out, because if you're sitting there with a packet of something, it's very easy to keep going back to it. Um, so yeah, I think balanced snacks and making sure that the portions are suitable as a snack and they're not turning into a, an extra meal in there, potentially. But um, I'm a fan of snacking. I don't think I'd make it through the day without, <laughs> without a couple in there. And um, I think I think the thing is as well is that a lot of the a lot of the high a lot of the other snacks that we would tend to choose like chocolate or sweeter or saltier items, a lot of them are designed specifically to override our feelings of fullness. So 
like Leila said there before, it's very easy to sit down and, and finish a pack of cookies easily, but it's not that easy to sit and eat four plates of broccoli because you would stop when you're full. And that the manufacturers have, have thought about it and that's why they make so much money. So it's all about just following the serving size and putting yourself in a really good position. So if you do want a couple of biscuits or some cookies, fine. Don't take the whole packet with you. Just sub it out into some portion sizes. And if that's two or three, great. Have that, enjoy the snack and then move on rather than allowing yourself to be put in a really vulnerable position, depending on what your goals are. But that, that's what I would say about the snack side of things. We had used the acronym before too. It's from, it's from AA, but it's HALT. So hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or thirsty. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to pay attention yeah. to why you're going to eat. For sure. Yeah. And I think as well as like a lot of the time, I mean, we can use food as a self care tool and that's absolutely fine but we want to make sure that there's more tools in our toolbox that we're not always going to food when we feel sad or angry or emotional or whatever kind of emotion we're feeling at the time so that's fine if it's one of our options but we don't want it to be the only option we have we want to have other things like going for a walk or yoga or drawing or whatever you like to do that doesn't always revolve around the snack inside of things because that can just make it really difficult to maintain you know blood sugars and your uh, cholesterol levels and a healthy weight. So just about asking yourself how you feel really. And I think we all see that again and again, right? That mindset is so important. And, you know, one of the things when people started the challenge is I got them just to set an intention for what they wanted to get out of it, right? Because it's not, it's really was to develop body awareness so that they could see what's going on and start to pay attention to our cues. And what is this cue, cue telling me? And what is my body trying, trying to say? Mm -hmm. um, so do we have any more um, questions from the field? Is there anything else out there on the side for these lovely ladies? <laughs> They've been popping up pretty good throughout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you have ladies, any other kind of key tips you'd like to share as we get ready to kind of wrap things up? I think um, one thing that I really try to sort of drive home to people is we're not trying to exclude foods or food groups from anyone's diet and it is very possible to enjoy you know a varied balanced diet and still have the things you really enjoy as long as you're a bit more conscious about how you're eating it when you're eating it and what you're eating it with um it usually comes down to pizza in my clinic you know can I eat pizza of course you can go out and have pizza you know and if you're thinking about how you can have that without it impacting your blood sugar so much then thinking about priming your stomach you know can you have a good vegetable or salad starter and some protein first and enjoy that and then go on to the pizza that maybe perhaps you're sharing with someone so it can be included as part of your, you know, as part of your diet, but you're just a little bit more conscious of how, how you're eating it. And I think that applies to most foods, whether it be like, you know, a sweet treat here or there. Um, there's a massive difference to if you have that as a snack or you have it after a good balanced meal, that makes a big difference as well. Yeah, but food is a massive part of our lives. So we want to be able to enjoy it um and it's just about it's just about finding that kind of that middle ground so that you when you do go out for your birthday or anniversaries or whatever it is you're able to sit down and enjoy a three-course meal and it's not an issue as long as the majority of the week you're kind of sticking to those kind of basics of healthy eating and you're being active and and all the rest so there's it'll be very very rare for um any of us in clinic to tell you not to eat something but we'll definitely tell you how to team it up with other foods yeah, and I think that stress around food isn't useful also um, for people to have that mindset going into it or feeling that there are bad foods or, you know, say they did eat something that they thought was a bad food they shouldn't eat and then becoming stressed about it. That's not going to help the cycle either. So, yeah, absolutely. And um, we have one more question from the side about snacking, if I can come back to that, but it's such a great point that you talk about no good and bad foods. It's, you know, it's nutrition. The closer you can eat to whole food is what I try to encourage patients and to try to stay away from a lot of the processed package, right? Mm -hmm. 
So, cause real food is real food. It's grown on our earth, right? Um, and sometimes we have to restrict quantities if we have a certain health condition like diabetes. Um, but yeah, food can be for us. It can be for enjoyment, for pleasure, which is why one of my big things is when people say that I cheated, I, I try to correct them right away. I say, <laughs> you, just, you know, you treated yourself. You just had fun. Because as soon as we attach that negative connotation, then it's the good and the bad. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's nourishing. We just have to think what's nourishing my body, maybe what's depleting me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But think about the nourishment. Mm -hmm. um, so a question about snacking, and we probably talked a little bit, but what's the best thing you can eat in between meals if you are hungry before the next meal? Oh, I think that very much depends on your preference, whether you're a sweet or savory snacker. Um, I mean, I can give you some of my go-tos that I have in my drawer, <laughs> in my desk at work. Um, I've always got a piece of fruit in there, so usually apples. I've got a bag of like mixed unsalted nuts in there. Um, and I usually have in the fridge, maybe some tuna mixed up with a bit of mayonnaise and some crackers, something like that. So it really depends. Yeah. What's your preference on taste? What about yours, Keelan? What's your big, your snacks that you like to always keep on hand? <laughs> I'm a little bit more of a sweet, a sweet fan. Um, but normally the same, same idea, I would always usually have yogurts in the fridge for me um and some fruit for sure uh cheese sticks are a good go-to sometimes for a little bit of protein and a very convenient snack and they're already pre-portioned out um and then in my drawer I have a few different types of crackers um I'm trying to think if I have any sweeter snacks in there now but I don't think I do um cereal bars are a real tricky one or granola bars sorry we call them here a lot of people ask me about those um, I think for the context of this talk, I would normally get people to choose literally anything else because <laughs> granola bars can be a really, really high in sugar, depending on what you're choosing. But uh, very similar to what Leila just touched on. So I would always try and team it up with a protein, whether that's some peanut butter, apple, um, and then maybe some hummus or some low fat ranch, maybe even some salsa and some veggie sticks or mixing it up together. So you have some vegetables and some crackers rather than just relying entirely on crackers and tortilla chips. So you can make it interesting, but you can compromise. Um, so there are a couple of good things. Um, yeah, I think they asked, uh, are processed meats a no-no like pepperoni or, do, or can we count them as protein? I mean, they certainly have protein in them. They just have a, a lower amount of protein, really, for the amount of... So, I mean, if you're talking about things like pepperoni or any salamis, they're mostly considered red meat. Um, and when we, we... We really want people to prioritise things. If you do eat meat in general, so it would mostly be chicken, fish, and turkey, the portion size of those would be the full size of your hand normally. So they would be considered the leaner proteins. When we talk about more red meats and more processed meats, the portion size massively reduces because of the amount of saturated fat that they have in them. So when you look at salami or pepperoni, you can see the little kind of white circles. That's that's usually the fat content. And also if you're looking at pork chops or a steak or lamb, they're tastier meats, but that's due, due to the higher fat content. So really the portion size reduces to about four ounces. If you're talking about a snack of processed meats, I would try and limit it as much as possible, especially as because normally those little the packs of processed meat normally comes with cheese. So you're having a lot of um, higher fat protein options, I guess, is how I would describe it. So really, I would use those things as a very small add on. So rather than the main event, so you could have maybe a couple of slices of pepperoni, but then you're also having maybe some hummus on the side with some carrots and celery to balance it out. So you're not having to eat a very large amount of the processed meat. I guess that would be my advice. I don't know if you have a different opinion, Dela. I would say because snacking is something that's going to happen probably quite frequently, you know, throughout the day, then just opt for something that's not a processed meat product, whether it's like eggs or tuna, or you can even buy like, pre-cooked chicken that's not processed you know it's like a, a cooked chicken breast that's been sliced that would be a much better option it might be that you know you have a pepperoni pizza every now and then but if you're trying to find your go-to snacks then 
it's best to avoid the processed meats because it would be on a daily basis likely otherwise. And I think for some of the Canadians in the room, we do have, because we do a lot of hunting where we come from, many of us, and people have like a moose or deer and they'll often make it into a jerky, but it's, you know, it's a, basically a farm, like a, a wild animal and they just put spices into it. So that actually okay. can be a great option uh, oh, because yeah. no, I think you're from the Maritimes as well. And so people will do that mm -hmm. or they'll make up sausages and having a cold sausage or something like dipping in some mustard, that can be a nice, uh, a nice option to have too. Is that a similar thing to like biltong, the South African biltong? Like yeah, but I, th I think so. They just, I think they do add more fat to biltong. To, to the deer and moose meat, they do often add a little fat because it's just so lean. Otherwise, yeah. it would dry out on the stick. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. It's, it's, never heard of that. it's really good. Um, <laughs> and then, but my go to snack, so again, I'm the same. I love to have nuts. Like that's my kind of big go to that I always have. And there's some nuts that you can get mixed in little bags. And I actually gave them out as treats at my office. Um, and I bought them at one of the shops here. Some of them come with that dried cheese. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of dehydrated cheese, which moon cheese, they call it. And then the other ones came with the dark chocolate, which is really good. But I have also, I have a coconut manna butter, if you've ever tried mm. this. So instead of like peanut butter, it's coconut butter and it tastes just like eating a coconut. But so sometimes I'll take a spoonful of that if I'm really hungry. I have a big jar in the office. Um, but I think with snacking in general, it's, and I talk to people about having emergency foods. But having something available, like we said, it's in our drawer, it's in the fridge, but you know, I have it or I take something in the car because if we don't, then that's when we start to make those food choices. We stop at the gas station and what do we see? Mm -hmm. Pastries, chips or whatever crisps, you know, that are hanging off. So, you know, having food prepared ahead of time is really important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Also, will save you a lot of money too, especially yeah. in Bermuda. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so much tonight. This has been so wonderful. I'm going to share this with all my patients and it's going to be on our Facebook and I'll share it with, with both you as well. I think we've had lots of questions from the crowd. And if there's any further, then you can ask in the Facebook group. So thanks so much tonight, Island Nutrition. And, thanks for having um, us. Thank you. And yeah. Thanks for thank joining you. us on the blood sugar challenge. Have a great night. Bye. Thanks, Thanks you too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.